Because it's a construction job, you know, and because it involves hundreds of people and because it has so many elements that have to come together, that very often it doesn't work out well. And um, I feel that I've been very lucky in the number of them that have turned out well for me. I just feel enormously pleased when that happens. I think Andromeda Strain was a very important movie. It was a, a major first for Michael Crichton. It was a hugely successful book. I thought it was a very interesting movie for Robert Wise. It was a great opportunity for me because it was a springboard into silent running. It was an important movie in a lot of ways, and I think it was a very interesting film, filled with a lot of stuff that you've never seen before or have never seen since. Wildfire was built for germ warfare. Wildfire and scoop. And you knew, Stone. It's an excellent screenplay. Don't be afraid to say it. <laughs> it was an excellent novel, and uh, it had a wonderful director. So why shouldn't it be a well-crafted screenplay? And it's one of his best films. I've done every genre there is, and I approach each genre in the cinematic style it deserves. And that's what I think I did with the drama strain. I think it paid off. Everybody's dead! What happened? They brought it on themselves. Who? The people in Piedmont? I thought it was a very good film, and I thought we did just what was indicated in, in Michael's book. I was very pleased with the results of it. It turned out well. We can feel confident your so-called biological crisis is over. As far as Andromeda is concerned, yes. However, with this new knowledge, there's no guarantee that another so-called biological crisis won't occur again. I was one of those kids who seemed to know very early what I wanted to do. And I was very drawn to writing. I did a lot of it, starting around the third grade, when I wrote this enormous long puppet show. And at that time, most of the third graders were writing a page, and I had this long thing. And I just, I wanted to do it. I think when I was 14, I had visited a place in Arizona called Sunset Crater National Monument, which was a volcanic cinder cone. I thought it was extremely interesting, very little known. So I was complaining that people didn't have more knowledge about this place. And either my mother or my father said, well, why don't you write an article? And I said, oh, I can't do that. And they said, no, no, the New York Times accepts articles in their travel section from all kinds of people. So I wrote an article and they published it. When I was in college, it seemed to be so difficult to be successful as a writer, purely as a writer. So I studied medicine, but I had always wanted to write. I was in medical school because I didn't feel that I could probably make a living as a writer. I'd read that only 200 people in the United States were able to support themselves full-time writing books, and I thought to want to be one of 200 people in the entire country seemed a very difficult group to join. 6,000 doctors are graduated every year, so that was much more doable. And while I was in medical school, I began to write to pay the term bills. And I wrote under a pseudonym because the grade that you get in medicine is very dependent on the evaluation of your teachers. There are exams, of course, but the largest component of your grade is what the professors think of you. And I was quite convinced that if they knew that I was running off to write books, that they would think less of me. And 
So I wrote under a couple of pseudonyms, and then when, when they finally found out, they did think less of me. The names I chose were John Lang and Jeffrey Hudson. John Lang, I drew from my own first name, which is John. And I thought of these books that I was writing, which were sort of James Bond thrillers, as fairy tales for adults. So I associated them to Andrew Lang, who was a collector of Victorian fairy tales. And Geoffrey Hudson was a dwarf in the court of Charles I, a great adventurer, actually. And uh, I thought it would be very entertaining for me to have the name of a dwarf. The book that I wrote in the name of Jeffrey Hudson was a book called A Case of Need, and it was option for a movie and eventually made by Blake Edwards. And it made my life very strange because I was sometimes going to California to talk to the screenwriter, then I would come back and put on my whites and be in the hospital again. And it was this strange difference between being a, really an impoverished student and then having these periods where you got into limousines and <laughs> drove around like that. And it was making me a little crazy, actually. But even when A Case of Need won an Edgar for the best mystery, and I had to go down to New York and accept it, no one in the medical school ever found out. I was going to do a book which ultimately was published as Five Patients, and I had to go to the dean in order to get permission to not do certain classes in order to write this book. And he said, well, writing a book was very difficult. Did I realize how difficult it was? Had I ever done anything like that? And at that point, I finally thought it was okay. I said, yes, actually, I should have written five or six books. <laughs> and he, he thought it was quite odd. But The Andromeda Strain was written without anybody in the medical school knowing that either. What happened was when Bob Wise bought it to make a film out of it, that got publicized, that there was this kid at the medical school who'd sold the book to the movies for a lot of money. And my picture was, you know, I was on the wire services, so the story was out at that point. Everybody knew. The gaskets are decomposing. It's Andromeda. The germ of the idea actually was a footnote in an academic book. It was a a book called The Major Features of Evolution by a scholar named George Gaylord Simpson. And for some reason, he included this footnote, there must have been three or four footnotes in the whole book, and this one said, science fiction writers have never written about organisms that might be in the upper atmosphere. And I thought, well, isn't that strange that he would interrupt his textbook on evolution to, to make this odd little comment, and it stuck in my mind. And the second thing that I had then was a title. I had this title, The Andromeda Strain, and I thought, I really like this title. This is a terrific title. I didn't have a book, but I had a title, and I couldn't give the title up. So I kept trying to think of a story <laughs> that might suit the title, and I tried and tried for a long time until I finally began to put something together. There were several organizing ideas. I think the most important for me was the idea of treating it as if it were true. So I wrote it in this very kind of detached way and had footnotes and bibliography and I thanked people in the introduction and all these things to make it appear as if this had been a real event that I was writing about and a great many people were fooled. The other thing was that I was interested in the notion of a technological crisis because it seemed to me that no one was really writing about these events. In other words, there's a category of event that really once it occurs, it can't be satisfactorily resolved. The best thing that can happen is that it never occurs in the first place. A good example is an oil spill. You know, once the oil is, is going into the ocean, there's actually not much of anything you can do until, except wait till it's done. And I thought that there was a long tradition of writing about people in which they individually took action and responded to, I mean, I suppose the kind of story that was exemplified by a Western, for example, you know, the tall, dark stranger rides into town and writes the wrongs. And I was more impressed by the notion of people caught in some kind of a technological machine that was going wrong and they couldn't do, really do anything about it. So that was the sort of story I was writing. I was in medical school, so I was being taught every day all these complicated matters. And I just used it. I didn't do any research at all, actually. I just wrote it based on what I knew. General Sparks here. I just wanted to inform you that all members of your team have been cleared and are now being called in. You'll get complete details on everything when your team is assembled. All the characters are based on people, the real people, real scientists. And some of them are combinations, but 
Some of them are, I mean, I was a young writer, I didn't really know, and I didn't expect much attention to be paid to what I was doing. I certainly didn't expect it to be a big bestseller. And one of the scientists realized that I modeled it on him, and he was quite angry and wrote a letter to the publisher and to the movie company saying, you know, he realized that he was this particular character and it was okay, but they just shouldn't push it. There must be a connection. I had originally written it in a, what I would think of as a conventional manner, and it was not persuasive. And at that time, I didn't have a very clear idea about how certain kinds of narrative forms will clash with each other. And in trying to figure out how to make it work, Actually, Bob Gottlieb had said, make it realistic. I don't really know that anybody actually tried to do such a thing. So what I did is I went and got all these nonfiction, sort of popular books about science and read them, particularly looking for narratives, you know, stories about how something or other happened. And I looked at the language to try and see, you know, the kinds of phrases that would be used and the kind of distance that you would have from from the characters if they were real characters. You know, you really wouldn't know exactly what was happening to them every minute, and that you would be dependent on their recollections after the fact, which were likely to be distorted or unsure. And so that was what I was using to work with. The idea was to have it be a sort of nonfiction book, then it should have illustrations. And I even went so far as to get Petri dishes and put, I think it was salt in them, and photograph them you know, trying to have photographs of the organism growing, but the publishers wouldn't go that far. But they did include a lot of the sort of, what they thought were computer-generated graphs, actually that were done on a IBM Selectric typewriter that had a sort of computer face ball in it, and I would just roll the, the carriage up and down and, and make these little drawings. The reason why I wrote it under my own name is that I had decided not to continue in medicine. So the principal reason why I had disguised my identity for all those years was there was no longer any purpose to that. So I wrote it under my own name. I wanted to work with the editor, Knopf, whose name is Bob Gottlieb. And he was very young and very famous in publishing at that time because he had edited Cash 22. And he was thought to be the best editor, certainly the best young editor in New York. So I went to do this book that was eventually Five Patients, and before that I thought, well, you know, since I'm doing the Andromeda strain, so maybe we'll start with that. The story is a how-done-it, a variation of a who-done-it, with scientists playing detective and tracking down the killer, then trying to remove its lethal sting. When the book was finally finished, my editor, Bob, called me up and he said, you've done a very good job. It's going to sell 2,000 copies, and no one will ever know about it, but you should take satisfaction out of a job well done. And that was where, as far as I was concerned, it stood. Until one day they called up and said, we're selling it to the movies, and do you authorize this amount? And I sort of gasped. Then they called back the next day and said, well, it's actually a lot more than that. And then it was in the newspapers. The reviews were actually quite good. I think it's the kind of reviews that a newcomer gets, you know, that sort of fresh voice. And people were surprised at how old I was because it seemed to be the book of a much older mind, you know, a sort of cranky, curmudgeonly kind of person. And they couldn't see that this kid had written it. It was a strange time. It was a time where I went from being a private person to a public person. We now know beyond a doubt that other forms of life exist in the universe. However, with this new knowledge, there's no guarantee that another so-called biological crisis won't occur again. When I wrote the book, I was protected by the fact that I didn't think anyone would pay any attention to it, which is, I think, the, the greatest freedom that you can have, is that no one cares what you're doing. You know, no one's interested, no one's going to read it anyway, so do what you want. And I think as you get older, two things happen. One is you begin to have this working past, which you either have to live up or live down or live beside or evade or whatever you decide to do, you're still obliged to deal with it in some way. And when you're young, you don't have that. And it was a very free time.